to everyone. I'm going to get going for our webinar. My name is Leanne Barda, and I am president and co-founder of Indiana Line Connect. We're so glad that you have joined us this evening. Um, I, ILC is glad to have you. This is a part one part of a three-part series on tick safety. And before introducing tonight's speaker, we want to introduce ourselves and share a few announce, announcements with you. Let me put some information up for you. First off, Indiana Line Connect is a nonprofit with a mission to dramatically reduce tick-borne illnesses in Indiana. We do this in three ways. First, by connecting Hoosiers, not only to information on Lyme disease, but also to research-based effective tick prevention strategies. Secondly, we connect Indiana healthcare professionals to accredited educational courses on Lyme disease and other tick-borne infections. And we also connect those suffering from Lyme disease to a compassionate support community. Indiana Lyme Connect, or known as ILC, is an all-volunteer nonprofit who depends on your donations. And these donations are tax deductible. Check out our website for the donation button and other ways to give. And now it's time for our presentation. We are delighted to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Emily Klosterman. Dr. Klosterman is a, a board certified veterinary internist and medical director at MedVet Indianapolis, where she has been a part of their team since November, 2020. Dr. Klosterman has an impressive resume. She holds a degree in zoology and veterinary medicine from the Ohio State University, a master of science in clinical and translational research from Purdue University, and completed an internship in, in medicine and surgery, as well as an internal medicine residency at Purdue University. Dr. Klosterman has a special interest in Nephrophily, her favorite part of veterinary medicine is the complexity and challenge of internal medicine, as well as teaching clients about their pet's diseases so they can better understand the goals and treatment choices regarding their pet's health care. She also loves cats. We are so grateful to Dr. Klosterman for her time tonight, as well as to MedVet for their support. Now sit back and enjoy her presentation on tick safety for pets. All right, everybody. So um, the topic tonight will mostly be Lyme disease in dogs. We have in parentheses horses because horses can get Lyme disease. One, the evidence is uh, not as strong about what happens in horses and also because I'm a dog and cat veterinarian. <laughs> so the information that I am most comfortable with and experience in a day-to-day -day, um, life is essentially the, um, the medicine related to dogs and Lyme disease. Um, as uh, Leanne mentioned to you, um, I did training at Purdue University. So I'm happy to be back in Indiana, but actually before I was in, um, in Indiana, my second time here in November, I was practicing in Pennsylvania and Lyme disease is endemic in Pennsylvania. And so I have actually a lot of experience. I'm treating Lyme disease in dogs and uh, certainly makes me a, a good uh, candidate for passing this information along to you guys. So hopefully you'll find it um, useful for yourself and your pets. Um, so this is a, a slide showing the essentially the spread of Lyme disease over time. This is information from the CDC's website. You can see on the um, left-hand side of the screen, there is the date of 2012, and to the right-hand side of the screen, uh, the date of 2018. Obviously, that's a while ago at this point. The CDC uh, needs to update their uh, beautiful graphics. But it's a very brief introduction to show the, the, the occurrence of Lyme disease in people. So each dot of blue will represent a person that had Lyme disease. And in a county where a lot of Lyme disease is happening, the blue gets you know, deeper and deeper. And what you can see from these images that you know, 
particularly Pennsylvania, where I uh, was practicing, that state is over time becoming more and more overrun with cases of Lyme disease. And it also um, seems to show that Lyme disease is kind of spreading more so up into Michigan and Wisconsin area and also spreading west. Um, that is definitely a trend that continues um, the spread of infectious illness, particularly illnesses um, transmitted by insects, um, is definitely affected um, by climate change. And that's definitely something that um, we will continue to kind of battle um, in, the, in the future. And the purpose of this slide, even though this is a slide about Lyme disease in people, um, where there are human cases of Lyme disease, there are ticks that can transmit Lyme disease. And so there are cases of Lyme disease in dogs. Um, the good news is as a cat lover, um, cats appear to be resistant to Lyme disease. So occasionally they can test positive for Lyme disease, but we don't actually think that the disease harms cats in any way. Um, so that's why this talk is mostly, again, gonna be focused on dogs. Um, no, your dogs can't give you Lyme disease, but if your dog has Lyme disease, then you're living in an area where you could get Lyme disease and vice versa. So that's the importance there. Lyme disease is transmitted by the black-legged or deer tick. Um, this is uh, this delightful creepy crawly picture of what this um, tick looks like. There'll be a slide later in the seminar um, expressing how small these ticks actually are, particularly before they've um, taken a blood meal. Um, so definitely keep in mind that uh, these ticks can be hard to find sometimes, um, but they're going to be these brown ticks um, with a kind of this dark brown um, shell at the top near its neck. Um, so these are the types of ticks that transmit Lyme disease, and these are the types of ticks that we're worried about for this particular disease. Um, that being said, you don't really want any ticks around. Um, pictured here is the brown dog tick, the American dog tick, the lone star tick, and all of these different ticks transmit other diseases to dogs. Um, anaplasmosis or lichiosis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, essentially, these are um, the types of organisms that you don't want in your yard, you don't want on your dog, and you don't want on you. Um, so for that reason, you know, we we'll need to be talking about, you know, what we can do um, to protect ourselves and protect our pets. Um, as I'd mentioned um, earlier, um, the geographic distribution of infected ticks has expanded with bird migration, suburban sprawl, and climate change. Um, the image below shows the range of the black-legged tick. So basically half of the United States has this particular tick uh, in the environment. And then the percent of ticks that are carrying the Lyme organism, which is Borrelia burgdorferi, um, can reach 30 to 50% within these endemic geographic locations. And endemic just means this is an area where the infection is common. Um, it wouldn't be rare to get the disease or diagnose the disease. And again, that's mostly the Eastern seaboard, as you remember from the um, slides previously, but that spread westward and a little bit south southward is also happening with this disease. Um, so if you see a black-legged tick in this half of the country and particularly towards the Eastern seaboard, there is a decent chance that you could be encountering a tick that is carrying this organism inside its body. Um, so we're gonna talk about the disease in dogs, um, what you should be aware of with your own pets and um, the typical signs that we see with kind of different versions of this disease. Um, the most common thing that will actually be diagnosed is an incidentally discovered infection. A pet who was screened on routine testing, you know, when they go in to see your vaccines, um, but there are other types of Lyme disease on patients that get fevers and a kind of a general systemic illness. There's a condition known as Lyme arthritis. There's a condition known as Lyme nephritis. And then there are also some secondary autoimmune diseases that I'll briefly mention. So the incidentally discovered infection in dogs in high incidence areas, many dogs are found to be positive for Lyme disease but many of these dogs also don't have any clinical signs. And this is just part of a routine screening test. 
And the test pictured on the slide here is a SNAP test called a 4DX. And it's probably the most common way that a veterinarian will screen for tick-borne diseases. And the 4DX means it actually screens for four different diseases, and one of them is heartworm. So yearly, um, most veterinarians are recommending heartworm screening. And so your Lyme testing will most often be included in that. And so pets can come up positive um, for a Lyme disease on you know, routine screening testing, and the pet has no clinical signs. Um, this can identify dogs that need treatment, but it can also identify dogs that have had previous exposure to the infection and they fought it off themselves and they don't have an active infection and thus they don't require treatment. Um, there are additional tests that can be run to determine um, how recent the infection was, how high the antibody titers are, which would you know, give some indication about um, whether this is a, a more important infection in a patient's body or not. Um, but most of the time, if the pet's not sick and they're coming up positive for Lyme disease, the most common recommendation could be, we're not going to do anything. Your dog has been exposed to Lyme disease sometime in the past, but there's nothing to do right now. Uh, except again, to keep in mind that if your dog is being exposed to Lyme disease, then you are in an area where these ticks are out there. Um, in incidentally discovered infections, there are occasionally veterinarians that will treat with um, antibiotics just in case. Um, but we do wanna keep in mind that the particular antibiotic most commonly used, it's called doxycycline, is hard on the stomach. And in general, we're in medicine trying to avoid overuse of antibiotics. Um, antibiotic resistance is a significant problem in medicine. So we don't want to willy nilly treat patients with antibiotics that we don't need to. Um, that's why sometimes we will recommend this test called the C6 antibody titer. And this is a test that essentially helps us figure out patients that might really need the antibiotics. Um, another thing to mention is that patients who have a high titer um, should have their titers rechecked in six months. Um, what you'd like to see is if a patient has a high test that they get treated and then you retest them six months later and you find that that um, test has dropped, which usually suggests that that patient has, you know, has gone successfully gone through treatment. Um, this is another point that we'll get to um, sometime uh, in the next couple of slides, but we also would commonly want to test these patients for excess protein in their urine. Um, protein in the urine is a manifestation of Lyme disease where a dog's kidneys can be damaged. And protein in the urine doesn't really have clinical signs associated with it. There's no cough or lameness or limping or anything like that. So you specifically have to seek out the testing necessary, which is a urinalysis. So if you have a pet that comes up positive on routine screening, it is okay that we do nothing as long as the pet's doing well, though at minimum, we may want to screen their urine for excess protein. And then sometimes we will want to uh, do the C6 antibody titer test, and we may want to treat with antibiotics. If a patient comes back with a low titer, then they probably had their infection in the past and they don't need treatment anymore, as I previously mentioned. Now, if a dog actually gets sick from Lyme disease, um, usually they're going to have kind of classic signs of fever and generalized illness. Um, some dogs' bodies will respond immediately when this bacteria enters their body and they will just feel sick. Um, thus, Lyme disease can be considered in any generally ill dog, and of course, our suspicion for that increases based on geography and the time of year um, when people are out and about hiking and um, doing a lot more outdoor activities with their pet. Um, of course, lots of dogs will show a fever or loss of appetite or tiredness from lots of illnesses. Um, so this is certainly something where um, Lyme screening um, as part of that 4DX test um, can be recommended by your family vet in addition to um, you know, routine blood screenings like kidney checking kidney values and liver values. And that can make sense, you know, even though in this area of the country, you know, it's the um, severity of um, how many ticks are carrying Lyme disease is, is less than on the Eastern um, seaboard. 
Another manifestation of Lyme disease in dogs is called Lyme arthritis. And so that's Lyme associated joint disease. Um, this usually develops soon after the um, bacteria enters the, sp the patient's body. Um, in addition to the signs previously noted, um, like the fever and um, lethargy, tiredness, we can also see dogs that have swollen lymph nodes, are limping, have muscle soreness, or have swollen joints. Um, the way Lyme disease causes problems for these patients is that when a tick bites a dog, the Lyme bacteria enters their bloodstream and their body. And then that triggers swelling and inflammation as the bacteria travel through the body. And the, the joints appear to be very sensitive to the inflammation that's triggered with the Lyme disease. Oftentimes the joint closest to the tick bite is often the one joint that swells and it's the leg that they favor. Um, on the image um, I've included in the slide, I've highlighted the joints that um, will sometimes be infected or affected, excuse me, um, the wrist joint, um, the elbow joint, um, which is up um, close to the chest, the knee, and then the ankle joint. And sometimes this, these pets have just one leg that they're lame on, and there's one joint that seems swollen. Um, the swelling may not be visual, visible to the eye. You might not look at your dog and say, oh my gosh, the joint is so big, I need to get to the vet. Um, it might be something that only a vet could really pick up on when they're doing an orthopedic exam on your dog. Um, so if you have a dog that has a lameness like this, um, then you would you know, want to have them evaluated by your vet so that they can assess the joints more closely. Um, luckily, this manifestation of Lyme disease um, usually quickly resolves with antibiotics and possibly uh, the addition of anti-inflammatory medications. So most of these patients will make a, a decent recovery. Um, unfortunately, there is another very serious consequence of Lyme disease in dogs. It's called Lyme nephritis or Lyme-associated kidney disease. Um, as a veterinary internist, this is the type of Lyme disease I'm most familiar with. And unfortunately, it's also the most tragic. Um, it's a very devastating way that a pet can be affected by Lyme disease, um, which is very severe kidney inflammation. Um, these patients can again have relatively you know, nonspecific signs like poor appetite, vomiting, or lethargy, but then their blood tests can reveal that they're in kidney failure. And then when they're further tested, well, why is this pet in kidney failure? Then we can find out that this patient has a Lyme positive status. And so potentially the kidney failure is being caused by the Lyme disease. This would be one of those times where we want those C6 antibody titers to find out more about whether it is truly an active infection or an infection that happened in the past. But this is a very well-known syndrome with the Lyme disease in dogs. Um, renal failure plus being Lyme positive is concerning. Um, in these patients, immediate antibiotic treatment is recommended, but unfortunately, antibiotics doesn't do enough for these patients. In these patients, the inflammation is the in, excuse me, the inflammation in the kidney is triggered by the bacteria, but then oftentimes it kind of snowballs, and the um, damage to the kidney extends beyond just the type of damage that happens because of the bacterial infection. There's actually like an autoimmune component to this, where um, immune complexes that um, are created by the immune response to this disease actually get jammed in the kidney and cause these patients to have kind of like double kidney failure. They have damage from the disease, but they also have damage from the immune system's response to the disease. Um, these patients can have anything from mild kidney failure to severe kidney failure. And I've seen a large number of dogs um, pass um, from this you know, disease in just a few weeks or months um, from the kidney disease. Um, so it's a very serious consequence of Lyme disease. And I um, absolutely hated seeing this diagnosis um, when I was working in Pennsylvania because it is quite devastating. Um, oftentimes young, young animals, active animals, you know, fam family pets that are um, you know, out and about hiking with uh, family and friends and children. And it's a, it's a really um, very, very sad uh, type of Lyme disease that we definitely want to be avoiding here. 
Um, the other uh, manifestation of Lyme disease that we can sometimes see is secondary autoimmune diseases. And these are essentially um, kind of similar to what happens with the Lyme nephritis, where the, again, the Lyme disease can affect many different organs, but then the body actually begins attacking itself as part of you know, an overwhelming immune response to the Lyme disease itself. Um, again, this is something that's not directly caused by the bacteria. Um, so even after the antibiotic treatment to kill the Lyme bacteria, these patients can still remain sick. Um, the most common forms of this will be autoimmune blood disorders or multiple joint disorders. As I mentioned with Lyme arthritis, sometimes it's just one joint that a pet will have affected or maybe two joints on the same leg, but this might be many joints throughout the body. Um, this requires a specialized treatment course separate from the antibiotics of Lyme disease, but the good news is most of these patients will, will do relatively well. Um, Lyme nephritis is probably the worst and um, most devastating of all the versions of Lyme disease. Most of the other ones, if we make the diagnosis um, and start treatment appropriately, you know, pets can recover. Um, to switch over to Lyme disease in horses, um, Again, similar to dogs, you can have horses that come up positive with um, a, a test in a patient that doesn't have any clinical signs. So there are many horses that test positive and we just, we don't really have a lot that we need to be worried about um, for these patients. More severe versions of Lyme disease in horses include neuroborreliosis, which is essentially a severe neurological infection um, caused by Lyme disease, the Lyme organism, Borrelia. Um, it is rare. It's only been confirmed officially in a few cases of um, like publications in the medical literature. Um, however, there also isn't a test for the disease outside of autopsy. So we can potentially have horses that have very severe neurological signs and until they have an, uh, an autopsy, we don't know for sure that it is Lyme disease. Some of the things that you could potentially see in a horse like this would include um, atrophy, atrophy of the muscles along their back, difficulty eating, struggling to breathe due to problems in their throat, um, reduced function of the facial muscles, ataxia, which is essentially a norm, abnormal or sloppy walking, um, behavioral changes, twitching muscles, um, or neck and back stiffness or pain. Um, another sign in horses to watch out for is uveitis. Uveitis is inflammation of the eye. And so this occurs when the Lyme bacteria is actually in the horse's eye and it triggers severe inflammation of the eye. Um, horses with um, Borrelia associated uveitis may also show um, signs of the neurological manifestation or um, will subsequently develop that kind of later on in the disease process. Another relatively rare complication of Lyme disease in horses is cutaneous pseudolymphoma. This is essentially um, flat or raised nodular lesions on the skin that occur near the site of the tick bite. But then when a biopsy is performed, it actually looks like a cancer called lymphoma. But then when you further test this area that looks like cancer, it actually shows Lyme disease. Um, this is quite rare and certainly isn't anything to be um, worried about, but um, at least worth um, mentioning. Um, another kind of anecdotally described, but not well published um, manifestation of Lyme disease in horses is lameness. Um, I believe that it probably could be a manifestation of Lyme disease because dogs have similar um, side effects with the Lyme condition as well. Um, but there is very little research or published data to prove that lameness or stiffness is a form of equine Lyme disease syndrome. Um, overall, the kind of syndromes of Lyme disease in horses are just much less well documented in, um, as compared to um, dogs, but definitely um, worth bringing it up to, uh, to discuss with you today. Um, so those are the things that you'd want to be looking out for at home and your pets and your horses um, to get a little bit deeper into Lyme disease itself. Um, Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria. The bacteria is called Borrelia burgdorferi. 
It's a very small, microscopic, obviously, spiral-shaped bacteria, which is called a spirochete. You see in the picture here that it kind of has like a corkscrew appearance to it. It is transmitted by Ixodes ticks, which are those black-legged ticks that we talked about earlier. And they are main, the disease is maintained in small mammal reservoirs, rodents and rabbits, and it has about a two-year life cycle um, to get infections into um, hosts like dogs and horses and people. Um, this uh, slide kind of shows what this life cycle is like. Um, what I have pointed out here in red is that when ticks are born, they do not have any Lyme disease in them. So these um, patients are born naive, um, even if they have um, come from an infected mother. Then when they um, hatch from eggs and become larval ticks, they then go and feed and have a blood meal on animals out in the wild wilderness and the wildlife. And these are the animals that have um, the bacteria living in their bodies. And so this is a first chance for these larval ticks to pick up the Lyme disease, and then it starts living in their body. And that's essentially how this parasitic um, bacteria works to get infections from one pet to um, one uh, animal to another is via the tick bites. So after the larva, um, larval ticks possibly um, get infected from biting uh, these different animals, they then um, grow into a nymph-sized um, tick. And then these ticks will also feed. And this is a second chance for these ticks to pick up bacteria. And um, if a if a um, tick has already picked up the bacteria as a larval tick, then this is an opportunity for the tick to start spreading it uh, into different um, hosts. Then we get a tick turning into an adult tick and these ticks can um, spread to incidental hosts, which are the people and the dogs pictured here. Again, we're not normally like constantly being, um, you know, pulling ticks off of ourselves and um, being infected by ticks. So this is not part of the normal life cycle, but ticks will, you know, incidentally give it to people and to dogs. Um, also, we see a lot of transmission to deer um, as, as well. And so they're also pictured in here. And then these, uh, these adult ticks then go on to have eggs, but again, those eggs are free of infection and then the cycle begins again. As far as preventing this infection, only ticks can transmit the disease. So you can't get Lyme disease from your dog. Um, your dog it, you can't get it from you. Um, in dogs, the nymph ticks or adults are the most common ticks that are going to transmit this infection. And that makes sense because based on our previous slide, we have the um, larval tick, which is only gonna be able to pick it up for the first time, but is not gonna be able to give it for the first time. But then the second stage and the third stage, the nymph and the adult are the two stages of tick that can transmit this bacterial infection. Um, in horses, we do think that um, adults are maybe more likely to transmit it as the more adult ticks tend towards larger, larger hosts like deer. Um, what's important on this slide um, and definitely not to be missed is the size of these organisms. These um, images come from the CDC's website and you'll see that um, the nymph tick looks reasonably sized. You can see it on this slide, but it's only because it's blown up a lot. The edge of this image is a dime. Um, so this is a very, very small organism. Here's another picture of a nymph on someone's thumbnail. Um, these are tiny, tiny little things that you could easily mistake for a bit of dust. And thus it makes it very difficult to think that the only way that you're going to prevent tick infections um, on your pets is to look for ticks and pick them off of your dog. Um, that's not going to be a reliable way to make sure that your dog stays safe. 
Um, the one bit, bit of good news is, is that the transmission of this infection takes 50 hours. So quickly finding and removing a tick can help reduce the chance of disease process. Um, but it's just, as I mentioned, not enough. Um, so we want to look for additional um, prevention strategies for the Lyme uh, prevention. Um, if we do find a tick, did want to show you very quickly um, some images again from the CDC's website about how to remove a tick. Um, we want to grab them as close to their shoulders and head as possible, and then pull upward with steady or even pressure. We don't want to twist or jerk um, because we want the tick to come out whole. We don't want to leave their head or mouth behind in your skin. Sorry if it's giving anybody the heebie-jeebies here. Um, however, if you're unable to remove all of the tick, you can you can leave it alone. Just a little tiny um, bit left in your skin will kind of work its way out um, just like a, a little splinter would. You wanna clean this area with um, rubbing alcohol or soap and water. Um, you don't want to crush the tick, particularly while it's still in your body um, or your dog's body because you don't want to squish um, bacteria that might be in the tick into your body. So you want to, again, be as close to the head and neck as possible. Um, don't crush the tick and dispose of a live tick by putting it in alcohol, placing it in a sealed bag or container, wrapping it tightly in tape or flushing it down the toilet. Um, is there any reason to test ticks? Um, in general, this is not recommended. Um, this is because labs that do this testing are not required to have high standards. So the results could be unreliable. A positive or a negative could be unreliable depending on the lab that's used. Um, a positive doesn't mean that an infection was able to be transmitted. Again, it takes 50 hours to transmit this infection to a dog. And so if that's the situation, then just because this tick was um, tested positive at a lab doesn't necessarily mean that there's any you know, grave illness concerns. Um, also, negative results can lead to false assurances. Um, what if two ticks bit you and one had already fallen off? Um, so we, we want to be focusing on um, like the right processes um, for dealing with um, ticks and including that can be including you know, testing after or taking antibiotics after exposure. Um, symptoms uh, can also develop before uh, results are available for these tests. So we also wanna keep that in mind as well. Um, so what should you do if you know that your pet was exposed to a tick? Well, call your veterinarian. As a veterinarian, I'm obviously biased, um, but they're the ones that have the most expertise. Um, you know, all of this that I'm rattling off to you is after years of experience and um, learning. So certainly get their, your veterinarian's expertise and, and they'll help steer you in the right direction. Um, most of the time, um, if we're going to try to screen a pet for um, an, an infection, the tests that we run don't test for Borrelia burgdorferi, it actually tests for the body's immune response. And so you basically have to wait for the immune response to develop. And therefore these tests won't turn positive for about three to four weeks. And so some vets will just say, okay, well, if your dog is fine and you found a tick on your pet, well, let's check the um, blood tests that would be recommended in three to four weeks, not right away. Um, some pets, some vets will just treat your dog just in case. Um, say, we'll, we'll get some antibiotics. Um, potentially this could be in a situation where uh, a pet already has problems with their kidneys or some other issue where you, you just don't wanna take a chance essentially. Um, and those decisions are again, best left up to your veterinarian. So other ways that we can um, prevent uh, per transmission of Lyme disease aside from um, you know, pulling ticks off of uh, ourselves or our pets, um, tick scaping. So deer ticks preferentially live under the hardwood forest canopy or in leaf litter. So at home, we wanna keep our lawns cut short, um, keep brush and weeds um, away from our yards, use wood chips in our gardens to minimize vegetation and other weeds that ticks could climb up onto and use to like jump onto your pants or something like that. 
also exclude deer or other wildlife if you are able to. I know that's easier said than done um, in our area. Uh, in a pasture or a farm, um, keep areas clean, dry, sunlit, and regularly disturbed. Again, not places where um, you can set up shop. You, know, you want to, to rake and move around, um, have animals walking around to make it a not appealing place for a tick to live. Um, we want to reduce exposure to woodland and woodland edges. Um, so you know, starting your pasture farther in from the woods Definitely have good pasture mowing practices, clear leaf and tree debris, and exclude deer if able again. Um, ticks can survive in stalls and in pastures, regardless of winter conditions. Um, freezing and thawing has a more detrimental effect on a tick's ability to survive than consistently cold temperatures. Um, so certainly ticks can live uh, in the wintertime and cause infections in the wintertime. It is just kind of theoretically or um, uh, numerically less likely um, because we are not outside hiking as much. We're not gardening, we're not mowing our lawns, all of those kinds of things, but it's definitely still possible. Um, other ways to prevent these um, infections is to use chemical protection. Um, again, ticks can become active even during the winter as long as temperature increases to above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So year round tick pre prevention is recommended. I don't have any particular product that I strongly recommend, but common agents that we use are agents that prevent tick attachment. The drug names are Amitraz or Permethrins. And then we also like uh, agents that have relatively fast kill after attachment. Um, these are um, thus going to get the tick to fall off a patient's body before that 50 hours um, time frame is reached. Um, also commonly recommend tick collars. Um, these are, need to be applied tightly enough to have contact with the skin, not just the hair of the dog. Um, these are some of the most commonly recommended um, like monthly medications that you would commonly um, see prescribed like from your family vet. Um, Brevecto, Nexgard, Semperica, Revolution. These are all common drugs that, uh, again, we'd, pre we'd prescribe to pets to be taken you know, monthly as a routine preventative um, for ticks. It is, again, not going to prevent tick bites, but it's going to get these um, kill these ticks soon after they bite, and then they're going to fall off the pet's body. Um, this is a slide just kind of um, giving some more details about some of these um, different chemical protections that we can give to our pets, um, whether they, you know, it's okay for your dog to swim um, when they're taking them, um, whether they also prevent um, fleas or mosquitoes is in this column and like how old, whether you can give it to puppies um, or pregnant um, dogs is uh, also information in this included in this slide um, for your information. Um, in Lyme endemic areas, multiple modes of production should be considered. So, you know, a monthly preventative plus a tick collar. Um, I do also want to mention that the drug permethrins that I uh, mentioned earlier should not be used on or near cats. Um, permethrin toxicity actually occurs uh, or usually occurs when a owner applies a dog product on a cat uh, accidentally. Um, but cats can also groom a dog if they have a dog friend or if they're just in, in, in close contact with a recently treated dog, they can actually get permethrin toxicity. So we definitely want to be cautious if you, uh, with these um, medications if you have cats in the household. Um, signs of toxicity um, for this permethrin toxicity are muscle tremors, seizures, um, hypersalivation, so drooling a lot, depression, vomiting, or anorexia. Um, if you see any of these signs or connect that your cat could have been exposed to a permethrin because of your dog or a neighbor or something like that, um, the, the cat needs to go to the veterinarian's office right away. Um, permethrin toxicity is possible in dogs too, um, so keep that in mind. Um, the, there is a product called Sawyer. Um, the product is 0.5% permethrin. And there's another um, permethrin product. It's the top hit on Amazon. It's 10% permethrin. Um, 
the, they are probably both effective, but do we really need the 10% when maybe 0.5% would do just fine? Um, we definitely want to be you know, cognizant of those things when we're choosing the products that we put on our pets. Um, most of the time, less is more. Um, for horses, there are wipe on, pour on, or spray on products. Um, the types of drugs that we're looking for are cypermethrin, permethrin, pyrethrins, or piperonal albutoxide. Um, these can provide several hours of protection, but the problem with horses is they get dust on them, they sweat a lot. Um, when they're working out, they get dirt on them and often are out in the, the elements. And so we need to reapply um, these chemical protections a lot more in horses. Um, however, at least it, the kind of medical literature does suggest that these um, spot on products are subjectively successful in repelling ticks. Um, however, there, are, there is a need for better treatments for tick control in horses. Um, an interesting um, point to, to chat about is that there is a vaccination um, for Lyme disease available in dogs, um, whereas there isn't one available in people. Um, the vaccination isn't fully effective, but it definitely can be included as part of like multiple modes of um, Lyme prevention in dogs. Um, there is no vaccine approved in horses, um, but some veterinarians are actually using the dog vaccine in horses successfully with some high risk situations. Um, since I am not a horse specialist, definitely ask your horse veterinarian before you would you know, be doing um, these or you know, considering these types of choices. Um, the Lyme vaccination works because the vaccine is given to the animal and that vaccine then induces antibodies um, to the outer surface protein A, um, OSPA antibody, or, or excuse me, the protein, let me start over. The vaccine induces an antibody against the outer surface protein A, which is part of the Lyme um, organism itself. And so then to um, reduce transmission of the bacteria from the tick, the tick actually bites the patient who has already developed these antibodies from um, getting previously vaccinated. The antibodies then go into the tick's body and actually neutralize the bacteria in the tick's body before it then goes into the dog's body. Um, so when a tick bites the pet, the antibodies enter the tick and then the disease is never passed on to the dog. Um, the vaccine isn't fully effective, however, because the body is never exposed to the bacteria. And thus over time, the body starts to go, why did I get this vaccine? I never see this disease. Um, I don't need to be you know, wasting my time you know, making antibodies to this disease that my body is never seeing. Um, because again, it's getting neutralized inside the tick. And so then the antibody um, levels in the pet's body wane and you need boosters. Boosters are recommended annually, if not every six months. Um, at minimum, it seems like a lot of the literature suggests every six months for the first year that the pet is vaccinated and then yearly vaccines thereafter. Another um, kind of way to think about it is, well, when is um, a patient's exposure gonna be highest? usually in the summertime. So getting a booster in springtime, uh, if you're gonna do it once a year would make a lot of sense. Um, hopefully all of this information was helpful to you folks as far as um, your dogs and your um, horses and your family. I'm certainly happy to open it up to any questions uh, if there are any uh, floating out in the Q&A here. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Klosterman. What great information for all of us. Uh, so there is a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You can type in questions and I will uh, then read those to uh, read those to her and get back with you. Uh, uh, while I'm waiting for a few questions, we did get some through participants that couldn't be with us. So I'm gonna start with those, if that would be good. Sure, um, sure. One had to do with what you were talking about, the Sawyer product permethrin. Mm -hmm. And on their website, they have a video of 
spraying your dog away from cats, away from wildlife, but actually spraying the dog and then recommending to respray about a month later. What are your thoughts as a veterinarian of the safety to the dog? Do you feel like that is a good idea, especially if you have, you're out in the woods and your dog is going in and out, you know, fleet litter and it's not a protected area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is uh, certainly a well-recognized chemical that will help reduce ticks getting onto your dog. Um, so certainly I know a lot of, a lot of folks have discomfort about chemicals, but you know, most chemicals actually come from natural things that we found out were really useful natural things. And so we turned them into chemicals. Um, so actually permethrins um, started out as a natural, um, you know, natural world type of chemical that just became easier to um, manufacture and administer by putting it in a bottle as a spray or um, as a um, like pour on or a shake on or whatever um, we're doing for the horses as well. So it is absolutely a chemical that is acceptable to put on your dog. It's a well-known treatment um, to put on your dog to try to reduce um, exposure to ticks and tick bites. And all of these products uh, should be, you know, basically dosed or administered as per the like label on the bottle, essentially. Um, certainly I can see concern about a spray. Um, you know, is it getting evenly on the pet? Don't want to get it in their eyes, all of those kinds of things. Uh, essentially use logic. Um, I have had some folks, instead of spraying directly on a pet, um, wanting to spray on a towel and then wipe on the pet. Um, I think potentially you're going to get more chemical on the towel than you are going to get on the dog. And then you just don't get as much bang for your buck, so to speak, when you buy a product like that. Um, but overall, absolutely. It, the permethrin products are definitely you know, recommended as part of a multifactorial tick prevention um, approach in dogs. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, what you said that Lyme, that cats are not affected by uh, Lyme disease itself, um, but are there other tick-borne illnesses that they can acquire through a tick bite? Yep, absolutely. Um, ticks are uh, delightfully nasty little creatures when it comes to their ability to transmit diseases. So cats do not get um, clinical disease from Lyme disease. They can test positive for Lyme disease, but more importantly, they can get um, ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis, some of the other organisms that I mentioned, you know, other types of ticks um, can transmit to dogs. So in general, we don't want ticks around on our pets. Um, so that we can make sure that they aren't getting these illnesses. And um, that means for cats as well, we would typically recommend um, year-round flea and tick prevention, the flea and tick collars, if they're you know, really, um, you know, really like out and about um, and you know, spending a lot of time outdoors. Um, so it's kind of similar recommendations for dogs. Okay, and then also, in that with ticks on horses, there's a gentleman who says that he picks ticks off his horses all the time. I was wondering, do you know which kind of tick usually is on a horse? Or is it not, it could it be any kind of tick? It could be any kind of tick. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, um, ticks do not seem to be all that particular about which type of organism they're on, whether it be a person or a dog or a horse. Um, so the most common way that you know what kind of tick you're dealing with is to know the uh, geographic area where certain types of ticks live. You know, there are certain ticks that are mostly in the south or mostly in the east or mostly over on the west coast, but there's a whole lot of overlap. And so you can certainly see two, three, four different kinds of ticks in uh, a geographic area. And there certainly are a lot of places online where you can you know, figure out what kind of tick it is, identify it, and then know what kind of diseases that particular um, organism, you know, could be transmitting to your horse. Um, but similar to dogs, similar to cats, we don't want ticks on our horses. Um, and if we can, you know, do our best to keep, you know, these, uh, these insects off of our horses, the better.
Okay. Um, another question is if your dog does indeed have Lyme disease, has the C sex, you know, antibody titer is positive and they're treated, how long are they generally treated for Lyme disease? Um, most common antibiotic regimens are three to four weeks in length. Um, and usually with the doxycycline medication, there are other antibiotics that are used and recommended. And there are also um, different antibiotics depending on the type of Lyme disease. Um, sometimes if a patient has a certain type of Lyme disease, then we might recommend you know, one antibiotic over the other, but usually on average, a three to four week course of antibiotic and most commonly the doxycycline antibiotic. And as a follow-up, um, it's, it, you seem to allude to it in your slides that sometimes the doc can remain sick after that three to four week treatment. Mm -hmm. and, yes, unfortunately that's the case. Mm -hmm. So it's just treated on a, a individual basis. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's not that most dogs will get additional diseases, but some dogs can. So one being aware of the signs, um, you know, particularly with the, um, the blood illnesses, the kidney illnesses, the joint illnesses, um, just so that you can be aware of the things that might trigger the thought of, oh yeah, you know, we were, you know, out hiking recently. Um, I do know that Lyme disease is more common in, uh, the middle of the country these days. And if my vet didn't offer to screen for it, should I ask, um, to be screened for it as well? If a patient, you know, has developed these clinical signs, um, without the previous diagnosis. And then if they have had the previous diagnosis, uh, with the high Lyme C6 titer, and hopefully most of the time, um, they're already showing most of the signs that they're going to show, but sometimes they will show up kind of down, down the road a little bit. Okay. We have time only for one more question. So a question about the, you talked about the kidney, um, you know, having it affecting the kidney and is that, is the, if it's, if they're generally ill, is that an indication that they're having kidney issues? Unfortunately, kidney issues show signs via general illness. So if you have kidney illness, um, vomiting, loss of appetite, um, lethargy, weakness, tiredness, all of those things could be anything, but it also could be kidney illness. So oftentimes that will be why when you take your pet to the vet and you know list off these kind of more vague signs, they will say, hey, we should do some blood work because that allows us to check many of the organs, the liver, the kidneys that could potentially be triggering these types of um, clinical signs. Um, protect, perhaps one thing that you can see more commonly in um, dogs with kidney disease is that they can have increased thirst and increased urine production. Um, when you have kidney damage, sometimes your kidneys can't protect against dehydration by concentrating your urine and creating like the dark yellow urine. And as a result, you'll urinate more and need to drink more to keep up. And so that could be one additional clinical sign that could indicate kidney issues, um, but certainly is not reliable enough to say, oh, well, it's not kidney illness because it's vomiting without, you know, increased drinking. Um, blood work is going to be by far and away the best way to sort that out. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much, um, Dr. Klosterman, for your time and expertise you really did put a lot of time into this. So thank you so much. And we are also grateful to MedVet of Indianapolis for their support of this webinar. I think it was really, really helpful information. And as a pet owner myself and of the dog, um, I've been learning and I've learned a few things tonight. So thank you very, Excellent. very much. Great. Well, I was really happy to be with you guys tonight and uh, certainly happy to help out again. We also want you to help with our mission, which is to dramatically reduce tick-borne illnesses in Indiana by reaching others with this webinar series and about Indiana Lyme Connect. So we'd appreciate if you would go to our Facebook and you would like or share it or follow. Uh, you can also sign up on our indianalymeconnect.org on our website. 
You can go there and sign up for a monthly newsletter. We try to keep you updated on our outreaches to the community of Indiana, the items related to tick-borne illnesses and legislative action items. So please uh, get the word out about our organization and pass this webinar on to others. We also want you to visit the website to learn more about research-based tick prevention action steps to practice before you go outside in tick territory. You can learn how to acquire permethrin-treated clothing, which actually kills ticks on contact. You can learn more about effective skin repellent options against black-legged ticks, which carry the Lyme disease. And you can learn about tick habitat so you can avoid it and actions to reduce it in your own yard. Um, additionally, you can learn about what to do when you've been out in tick territory. And something is a little teaser is dry first, wash second. So I encourage you to go on the website and find out what that means. Reminder that we are an all volunteer tax exempt nonprofit and we do depend on your donations. Uh, you can donations make these webinars and other educational opportunities possible. So with that, we're going to close tonight and thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to, um, to providing more opportunities for our state and hope you found this information help helpful. And with that, I'll say good night. Thank you. Thank you.